What is up guys? Hi, welcome back to the channel. In case you are new, my name is Shilpa and I am a finance professional. I am also a CFA charter holder and in this video, we will try to understand what is an interest rate. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about them. They literally affect everyone. Banks talk about them, you hear about them in the news, government is talking about it. And somehow, interest rate manages to control whether you can buy that dream house or the dream car. But what is actually interest rate? Hmm, let's think about it. Interest rate can be explained in two different versions. Version 1 is you pay the rent for keeping someone else's money. For example, today I borrow 10 bucks from you and then at the month end I pay you back but I pay you 12. So, the 2 bucks that you made extra is the rent that I paid for keeping your money for one month. In this case, I paid you a 20% monthly interest. Now flip it. Interest rate can be the reward for saving money. For example, you go to the bank, you save a thousand bucks there. Instead of spending it somewhere, you just saved it there. And then at the end of the year, the bank says, okay, here's your 1020 bucks. So, the $20 that you earned extra, is the reward for saving money and this $20 is actually the and this $20 is actually the interest that the bank has paid you back so that's free money right um well sort of to understand whether this money is free or not we need to understand one key element so let's go right back to the basics we should know what time value of money is hmm Time value of money or TVM is a key financial principle that suggests that money today is more valuable than the same amount of money you might receive later in time. Why? Because the earning power of the money deteriorates over time. Now, why does that happen? That's where interest rates come into the picture. So if you have $100 today, you go to the bank, you save that money and then a year later, bank gives you back 110 bucks. So 10% is the interest you made on those 100 bucks. But why did the bank pay you that money? It is the reward for waiting to use your $100. Which means if you would have used those 100 bucks at that time, versus if you were to use the same 100 bucks today, they would have been more valuable a year ago. And so the bank has to reward you for waiting to spend your own money. Hopefully that makes sense. Hmm. So now you can think of interest rate as a choice between spending money and saving money. Which brings me to the next point, opportunity cost. That choice which we talked about between spending or saving money is called as an opportunity cost. Now, maybe it's a little more than that. So let's try to understand which is one of the most important but overlooked aspects of financial decision making. Opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative that you give up when you make a decision. It's the trade-off you face every time you choose one option over the other. Just how we talked about saving 100 bucks in the bank. Now, if you chose to spend that money, you would have forgotten that 10% return which you earned over a year. So think of opportunity cost as by opting for immediate consumption, you're sacrificing a future value. This is opportunity cost. Forgoing the potential benefits of future earnings for instant gratification. So in our previous example, 10% is the opportunity cost of not having the money today. Opportunity cost is also linked with the time preferences. Because if you prefer current consumption over a future consumption, the opportunity cost for you is going to be really high. Now that you understand the concept of time value of money and opportunity cost, let's go back to understanding what interest rates are. Interest rates can be broken into different sub-elements which in combination would decide what that rate is. Okay, now the interest rate can be broken down into several elements. Number one element is the real risk-free return. What's that though? If you go and buy some government securities, which are virtually risk-free, you make about 3 to 4% return. I'm going to stick to 3% for example, and then we'll continue and build up on this understanding. So government securities paying you 3% rate is your real risk-free rate which means virtually you do not have any risk associated with this investment. You pay 100, you invest $100 today, you get back 103. Good, okay. Along with the risk-free rate, which we just talked about, 
Let's add inflation on top of it. Assuming in a state where you live, the inflation is about 2% per year. Which means, if you were to go out and buy a pen today, it costs you 100 bucks. But if you were to go out and buy the same pen a year down the line, it's going to cost you 102. So this inflation element is added to the real risk-free rate to generate something called as a nominal interest rate. Which means, in order to survive, the, which means, in order to manage your cost of living and stay with the same standards, you need at least that inflation-related return. So if you were to go out today as an investor and invest in a non-risk-free security, that 5% return is the bare minimum you should be asking for. Because you could have earned 3% easily without taking any risk. And then on top of that, because you need to manage the same cost of living, hence adding the inflation. So you should be asking for at least 5% return when doing an investment in a non-risk-free security. That's the key part. <clears throat> okay. So now you're an educated investor and you go out to invest in a non-risk-free security. But should you be asking only for the 5%? No, because you could have made that by investing in the risk-free security itself. You should be asking for more than 5%. But how much more should you ask for? That's the concept we're going to try to understand next. The next element of interest rate is the default risk premium. Default risk premium is the extra return you should receive an, an investor because you're taking the risk that your borrower may not pay you back. If you were to go out today and lend money to your best friend who you know has always paid their debts on time, would you just be asking for 5%? Maybe not because with an individual borrower or other entities, as long as they are non-risk free, there is some risk of default associated. So you should be asking for a premium. In your best friend's example, I'm going to in your best friend's example, I'm going to stick to a 1% premium, which means if you're giving the money to your best friend, assuming that there is a risk involved, so you take the risk-free return 3%, your inflation 2%, and then finally, the default risk premium of 1%, which now makes your interest rate as 6%. So as an investor, your required return becomes 6%. But if you were to give this money to someone other than your best friend, maybe who you're not sure about if they would pay back the debts or not, then your default risk premium would slightly increase because you don't know if the borrower is going to pay you back. Now, depending on the reason for which the borrower is taking the money from you, they might end up generating higher returns and then you might end up feeling safer. So that default risk premium is the return you get on how comfortable you feel that you're going to get back your money. The higher comfort, the lower the return you're going to charge. So now you're a well-educated investor. You know what real risk-free rate is. You understand what inflation premium is. And you also know what a default risk premium is. All of these combined, you expect to make a 7% required rate of return. If you were to invest your money in a non-risk-free security, that's the key. But is that it? Mm, well, not really. Let's think about it. <clears throat> For example, your friend needs money to buy a bike and then they're going to pay it back to you in a year. Or they need this money to buy a truck. If selling bike is easier than selling truck, then the ability for the borrower to convert the bike money to cash is higher than his ability to convert the truck money into cash. This guys is known as the liquidity premium. It is the ability of an investor to convert the assets to cash quickly. The quickly you can convert, the less your liquidity premium is going to be. I'm assuming based on the investment that your friend is doing with the borrowed money, there is a 1% liquidity premium involved. So now is that all? And 8% required rate of return sounds good to us? Um, I'm sorry, but that's not the case. Let's try to understand why. If you were to give this money, to the borrower, who in this case is your friend, for a year, you're gonna ask for an 8% premium, which we have just broken down. But if you were to lend this money for two years, will you still expect 8%? Maybe not. What about three years? What about four years? So the higher the time period for which you have lent the money, the higher the interest rate is. And that guys is known as something called as maturity premium which depends on the time for which you have invested the money. 
So maturity premium is the compensation for lending the money and taking that risk for a longer period of time. The longer the time for your risk, the higher the maturity premium will be. Assuming in this case, it's going to be about 0.5%. So now we are finally there with 8.5%. And yes, this is the final rate of return you should expect. There are no more elements. Now you understand what real risk free rate is. You understand what inflation premium is. You know what liquidity premium is, what default risk premium is. And then finally, what a maturity premium is. That's how the interest rate is decided. Um, it might sound like a challenging concept, but once you get a hang of it and start looking at things around you, you would be able to connect very easily as to why banks, when you're doing some fixed deposits, pay you only 7% versus when you go out and buy the bonds, you get about 9%. And then if you invest in equity markets, you end up earning about 12 to 13% solid return in a good market. Why? because of all these premiums. So start observing around you today and you'll figure out the world is full of interest rates. To summarize, interest rates reflect the time value of money and are driven by several economic factors. They include that opportunity cost, which is your choice between spending or saving. And then it is a crucial concept, whether you're an investor or you're a borrower, because if you were to borrow that money, the other party is going to charge you some interest rate and you need to count in and you can negotiate better with them knowing what the default risk premium on your side is and the other elements which are not driven by you at all, right? And overall, understanding interest rate helps you make informed financial decisions. So stay educated, stay informed. If you like the video, please feel free to hit the like button, subscribe for more such videos and I'll see you in the next one. Till then, peace. Bye.